Hello and good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Welcome to Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we are very pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2014 webinar series. Today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Elliot Kotick, who is the content chief and co-founder of Not Impossible Labs, and Kofi Saname, the founder and catalyst at Volab. My name is Chitra Sethi, and I will be moderating today's webinar. When I'm not doing this, I work with American Society of Mechanical Engineers, where I am the managing editor for ASME.org, the official website of ASME. I would like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, 3D Printing and Development, Impact and Challenges. 3D printing is already changing the world. In Amsterdam, architects are building what might be the first 3D printed house. Surgeons in Holland have implanted a 3D printed skull in a woman with a rare disorder. Harvard researchers recently unveiled what they say is the first 3D printed battery. A team of people from around the globe have teamed up to create 3D printable prosthetics. And a California-based company is gearing up to send the first 3D printer to the International Space Station in August. 3D printing developments dominate technical news, but we are particularly interested in how this rapid manufacturing technology is utilized to improve quality of life in low resource settings. Specifically, what is being printed and why? How it's impacting the end users? And what are the limitations and implications to underserved communities worldwide? To answer some of these questions, we have invited today's presenters, Elliot Kotek and Kofi Saname, we thank you for joining us today. Before we get rolling, I would also like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series, Jana Aranda and Mike Mader of ASME, Holly Schneider-Brown and Steve Welch of IEEE, who work on developing and delivering the webinar series. Thank you, team. If anybody out there has questions about the series or would like to make a recommendation for future topics and speakers, we invite you to contact us via the email address visible on the slide, webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Before we move on to our presentations for today, we thought it would be a good idea to remind you about Engineering for Change, or E4C, and who we are. E4C is a global community of over 20,000 technically-minded members and more than 140,000 social media followers such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs, and social scientists who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges, whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation, or other areas faced by underserved communities around the world today. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies like ASME, IEEE, ASCE, SWE, and ASHRAE, plus academic supporters like MIT's D-Lab, international development agencies like USAID, EWB USA, and Practical Action, as well as access to passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Registration is easy and it's free. Check out our website, engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. The webinar you are participating in today is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free, publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring innovative ideas and technology to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series as well as archived videos of past presentations can be found on the E4C webinars webpage, engineeringforchangewebinars.org. That's the link on the slide. If you are following us on Twitter, I would also like to invite you to join the conversation with hashtag E4C webinars. E4C's next webinar will be on July 24th at 11 a.m. EST on the topic of off-grid energy solutions. We'll be discussing solar lanterns and debating the difficult question of are solar lights a turn off at scale? Stay tuned to the E4C webinars page for updates on the presenters and registration details. If you are already an E4C member, we will be sending you an invitation to the webinar soon. As you may have noticed, we are using a new webinar platform. We are excited to introduce you to a few of the new features this software has. 
On the screen you are now seeing, we have outlined the different widgets you will see on the dashboard at the bottom of this screen. The group chat is where you will interact with your fellow attendees and post any comments about the webinar. The Q&A widget allows you to submit any questions for the presenters. The help widget is for you if you're having any technical difficulties with resources on how to use the software and FAQs. Share This allows you to share the link of this webcast with your friends and colleagues through 13 popular social media sites. The Twitter icon allows you to post directly to Twitter. And lastly, the survey icon allows you to take our survey and tell us what you think of this presentation. I know this is a lot, so always free feel to scroll over the icon for a reminder. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Let's see where everyone is from today. In the group chat window, please type your location. Take a moment to read some locations as they come in. You can use the group chat to type any remarks you may have as well as to interact with your fellow attendees. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window access by clicking on the Q&A widget located at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions for the presenter. Any technical questions or administrative problems can also be handled through this widget. If you encounter any troubles viewing or hearing the webinar, you may want to try opening Webcast Elite up in a different browser. Also, feel free to access the Help widget for technical help. At the bottom of the screen, you will also see a survey widget. Please make sure to take a moment to fill out our short survey. We will leave the survey open for a few minutes after the webinar. Your opinions are invaluable to the webinar series. Without your comments and suggestions, the webinar series wouldn't be what it is today. Following the webinar to request a certificate of completion showing a professional development hour for this session, please follow the instructions on the top of our page, engineeringforchangewebinars.org. Today's presenters are Elliot Kotek and Kofi Sineme. A former biotech VC and M&A attorney in Australia and New York, Elliot holds a law degree, a BSc in pharmacology and toxicology, studied dramatic writing and acting at New York's the Lee Strasberg Theatre Institute, and completed UCLA's professional program in screenwriting. The content chief and co-founder of Not Impossible Labs and editor-in-chief and co-founder of Beyond Cinema magazine, Elliot has personally interviewed close to a thousand of the world's leading personalities. Born in 1980 in Togo, Kofi is architect and anthropologist. He manages and finances Volab, which has become a unique place that enables the pooling of resources and the mixing of different populations adopting low environmental footprint uses. It's an incubator for technological products that aims to create a vir virtuous circle for innovation in Africa. Kofi develops the strategy and plays the role of monitor to this little community, which now has about 20 very young members. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to Elliot for his presentation. Thank you, teacher. Uh, so, hi everybody, uh, my name is Elliot. Uh, I wanted to just quickly take you through some of the reason why we do what we do over here at Not Impossible. Um, what, where we started was with a, a, my business partner, with my co-founder, Mick Ebling. Uh, if you put him into Google, you'll see his TED talk on something called the iRider that I'll let you know a little bit about in a minute. And you'll see that he's a family man and he's a big, bald, white man, about six foot six. Uh, so I like to think that you got the friendlier, more internet-friendly version of the two co-founders because if you put my name into Google and press uh, images, you get this kittens, tons of them, which of course on the internet is one of the one of the greatest memes of all time. Um, with uh, with Nick and I, what we what we did is we started a company that was basically founded on the principle of technology for the sake of humanity. We look at the latest tech and the lowest tech and try and either apply it to the human condition and the human experience um, or repurpose old tech for the sake of humanity, looking at ways it can be used that hasn't been used before. The whole story of Not Impossible started really with a graffiti artist named Tempt and a pretty unlikely source um, for any technology platform to begin. But this graffiti artist had ALS and was completely shut into his own body with locked-in syndrome. And we're still using this kind of old technology that we saw in, in places like The Diving Bell and The Butterfly or other films where, where, or, and books where people are completely locked in. They're presented with a tool that was a sheet of paper with a bunch of letters on it and were 
asked to blink their approval through the range of letters until they spelled something, and that was their tool for communication, and that hasn't changed in you know in in dozens of years in in, in decades um, until not impossible came along and what we did was we basically got a group of hackers together um, and brought them to uh, mix house in Venice Beach and they took some old spectacles some old sunglasses from the Venice boardwalk hacked open a PlayStation 3 camera uh, added some IED and some wire and a couple of zip ties. And in a couple of hundred bucks, we're able to manufacture a solution that enabled this artist who was completely paralyzed to be able to use his eyes to draw on a computer screen. So essentially, it was using the pupil as the tip of the pencil. Um, and as he blinked to shut, when he blinked shut very hard, it turned on the pencil or put down the cursor. Um, and when he blinked hard again, it raised the cursor or raised the pencil. And then he moved his eyes and the ocular recognition software recognized his eye movements and enabled him to draw. It was an incredible experience to witness, um, but really it enabled someone who doesn't have access to communication tools to be able to communicate again. And this is pretty much the principle of every, the guiding principle of everything we do is that anyone who's lacking access um, in terms of physical act ability or geographic access or financial access, we try and come up with solutions that are disruptive in a way that enables these people to communicate or create um, or somehow other, you know, engage uh, with the community at large and with the internet community around the world. The iRider was incredibly successful, um, and without trying to be, we managed to garner um, a bunch of press around it and a lot of awards, and that's what led to kind of the next installments of what we're doing. In fact, the iRider itself, with ALS being a progressive disease, uh, has necessitated that we advance that technology, and so we're now replacing the blink mechanism with a think mechanism which means that instead of blinking or fast blinking to turn on and off that cursor, we're moving to a system that recognizes EEG waves. Um, and so the brain writer, uh, which has been developed, that's, you'll see a very early incarnation of it. <laughs> it's no longer a foil bucket over someone's head, um, but it's embedded currently in a, in a Nike headband and will be embedded into a baseball cap, but it's electrodes that sit above the skin. Um, and it's completely non-invasive, and it enables people to continue to draw and create uh, by turning it on and off, by calibrating it with brainwaves, and then to use their eye movements to continue to write and create. Um, and that launches a week from now, a week and a half from now, at the Barbican in London. So if any of you are in England, I encourage you to come out to the Digital Revolution Show at the Barbican. It's an incredible uh, assembly of technologies and uh, is the largest exhibition of its kind. It's going to run from 2014 to 2020 in eight or nine different countries. Uh, but we will be in a part of the exhibition that is available freely to the public, whether or not they buy a ticket, which is consistent with our whole ideology of access. Um, that's a quick snapshot of what the exhibition will look like. And those two boxes on the right-hand side with orange triangles will be places that you can either roll up to or walk up to uh, and, and actually experience using the Brain Rider to play a video game. So you can get the whole transition, you can get the experience uh, from a very real, very personal level. Uh, we are using 3D printed components in that, but really the reason why we're here to chat about what we've been doing is this project called Project Daniel. Uh, project Daniel for us has been a whirlwind. Uh, we began the story about July last year. You'll see this Time Magazine article that was dated in April, but someone brought it to uh, make my co-founder's attention last July. Uh, we read it, and basically it was about this doctor who operates out of the Nuba Mountains, Dr. Tom Katana. He's a lone doctor. He's the only doctor servicing an area that, that uh, has a population of about a million people. Um, it's in the very bottom tip of Sudan, um, and these people were fighting with South Sudan, but when the borders were drawn for that new country, they were left on the north side of that border. And so since then, they've been subjected to bombing raids by the government of Sudan, who are trying to uh, evict them from their native lands. 
um, the president of Sudan is the same person responsible for the Darfur atrocities. And so he remains the only leader in power who has war crime convictions against him. So he's been bombing this area where there's this lone doctor basically servicing these people. Um, the hospital itself is primarily solar powered. Uh, so there are not a lot of resources around. But another part of that article was about this boy, Daniel Omar, who was 14 when a bomb took both his arms. He ducked behind a tree, uh, but his arms were wrapped around it. And while his body was protected, his arms were, were, were ripped off. And Dr. Tom performed the W amputation. And when we read about this, we decided that this was something that we thought we should be able to help with given today's technologies. And on the Not Impossible website, we'd just interviewed Richard Van Ars, a South African inventor, really a carpenter, who had lopped his own fingers off. And he had designed what's known now as the Robo Hand, which is a 3D printed prosthetic hand, very basic and mechanical in its function. And we thought that that would be the perfect tool, something mechanical, not electric, because as we all know, scarcity of electricity in places like Sudan would mean that if the um, had a robotic component, then it would probably get thrown away um, if the charge was lost. So it had to be mechanical. So we brought a team of different people to uh, what was then our offices in Venice Beach, and we had a make weekend. And that make weekend included uh, people like Brooke Drum, who's the CEO of Printerbot, one of the early 3D printing, uh, consumer 3D printing companies, uh, with models ranging, I think, from about $250 upwards. So, again, fitting within our philosophy of access. Um, we brought Richard Van Ars out from South Africa. Uh, we brought some engineers down from San, uh, from San Francisco, uh, a couple of precision engineers from a company called Precipart uh, in upstate New York. And we brought all these people together and we worked on the prototyping uh, of a 3D printed prosthetic. Uh, there's a photo of Richard Van Ars on the left. He's the original inventor of the Robo Hand. But what we wanted to do is to tweak his designs and have him tweak his designs to make the tool, the 3D printed prosthetic frame, um, a little bit more durable for the Sudanese conditions. We then uh, like sent a team of four people. Uh, so it was uh, Mick Ebling, who's uh, my co-founder, and not a medical, uh, it's good to know that he's not uh, medically inclined, no medical training, uh, just someone who's pretty handy around a Home Depot or a Bunnings or whatever that equivalent warehouse type scenario is in, in your part of the world. And he went with uh, a photographer, a videographer, um, and a logistics expert to get to Sudan. So he went first to Richard Van Ars' house in South Africa, spent another week with him, kind of as a Mr. Miyagi Yoda type figure, learned as much as possible about putting these limbs together and putting them on um, people who need them. And then they got to a place called Yida, which the UN called the most challenging refugee camp in the world. The house is about 70,000 people, and that's where we found Daniel. Um, what was interesting is the project was called Project Daniel as a result of the story, but we didn't know whether we'd actually find Daniel himself. Uh, so it was kind of a coup uh, that, that Dr. Tom located Daniel in Yida, and we were able to connect with him uh, in, in South Sudan, in Yida. <clears throat> but Daniel was uh, a little bit skeptical at first. Um, he'd been offered other limbs before, other prosthetics before, and uh, and they really haven't been up to speed. But this one, a 3D printed prosthetic limb, uh, you'll see most of it is 3D printed. The only part that's not is the core cone, the cylinder in the middle that is actually around Daniel's stump. Uh, and that part is an orthoplastic, a medical grade breathable plastic. Um, so that can go directly onto the skin, whereas most uh, prosthetics require silicon stockings or a thick sports sock. Um, this one can be placed directly against the skin, and then all the 3D printed components are then attached to that to that cylinder, to that core. Um, it really acts quite simply. Uh, the mechanical function is driven by cables that 
wrap around, they come through as uh, almost like ligaments through the fingers, through the phalanges, uh, travel their way up around the cylinder, um, around the outside of the arm and basically get tightened as tight as possible against the straight arm against an elbow. And so as the elbow bends, it acts as a fulcrum point and draws the cables in, which draws the fingers closed. So it's really just an open shut mechanical hand, but it provides that degree of freedom, obviously, for someone who especially has had both his arms removed uh, to be able to feed himself again um, and you'll see in this uh, top shot on the left, uh, that's a shot of him feeding himself. That's some sugar on a spoon. That's him feeding himself for the first time in two years. Uh, what we love about this is, in terms of the change aspect of it, is it doesn't just free him up or give him the tool to enable him to feed himself, but it also means the other young boy whose, whose role it was in his community to provide for him and feed him and look after him in all sorts of different ways um, is now freer as well and uh, can use his time uh, more uh, more in tune with how a boy his age would, would spend it. Um, Daniel's a happy teen. He plays soccer. He he can get bratty. He he. When we introduced the computers to the area, he wanted to play games on them and play music on them, even you know with his stumps moving around on a tablet. Um, and uh, so it was pretty cool to watch. And and these hands were then assembled. Uh, we taught here's the top right photo. The the team of people there were basically went around and grabbed grabbed a few people that were recommended by Dr. Tom and trained them how to 3D print and put together these prostheses. And so that was the kind of the most rewarding part of the journey was them learning how to do it, making another arm for Daniel, then making another arm for this boy, Muhammad, who's in this shot here with Daniel. And uh, and then as we as the team left Sudan and got back to L.A., uh, there were photos of two additional people who'd had arms made for them by the trainees. So these, this proved to us that um, the project was scalable, that it was feasible, and that it could be rolled out to other countries. We left all the equipment behind for them uh, and set up what was, in essence, the first 3D printing prosthetics lab and training facility in the world. Again, it led to a lot of press from Time magazine and The Independent and The Guardian and all these different places, and it's had these numbers of media impressions. And the reason why this is important for us as a business is that we believe that if you do things without telling people about them, then it makes it hard to inspire others to do the same. And because we're about access and about enabling people to see that they don't need permission to innovate, um, that these tools are available to them and these files are available open source, uh, that means that more people can get helped around the world. We don't want to be the ones going around making arms for people. We want people to be inspired enough to find the resources uh, to make them themselves. So that's led to requests coming from different places around the globe. Uh, it looks like we now have commitments from sponsors to take it the Daniel Labs or the Not Impossible Labs to three other countries around the globe uh, within the next 12 months, and we're hoping for another 12, uh, 12 regions after that uh, by the end of the second anniversary of, of Daniel feeding himself. Uh, so something we like to ask people to think about when we, when we speak is because of this ability to have access to both the tools and the files is to ask you who your Daniel is. Who's that person in your greater community, the person you pass by every day or the person who's a friend of a friend who just needs a hand? Uh, quite literally, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, but there are people out there who can benefit from very simple technologies who otherwise wouldn't have access to them. So we ask you to consider who your Daniel is. Um, so think about that. It's kind of this basis of permissionless innovation we didn't coin the term or coin the phrase, and it's been the subject of some interesting discussion. But basically, with the tools that are available to us now and the ability for everybody to communicate with each other now, using the Internet, using these community forums, using things like we're using today with E4C, um, is that there's really no excuse if you have any inclination. Uh, there's no excuse not to try and innovate. No one's 
that needs to give you approval. There doesn't need to be an institution or a business around it. The tools are available to everybody and everybody can find their community online, um, regardless of whether they're the type of people who would otherwise, you know, leave their houses or have access to communities of other innovators in their, in their proximate geographies. So anyone can do it. It's available to anyone to try. Um, and kind of indicative of this point is that one of our teams that is working with us at the moment is doing a project that we call, at the moment, the Robot Walker. Everything we do, we name after a person, uh, but we haven't found the person for whom we're building the Robot Walker yet, other than we know that it's for children. Uh, but So as long as it's not a boy named Johnny, um, we will probably stick, we, we'll probably change the name uh, to anything else uh, around that person. But we've got a team of 16-year-olds who are helping uh, build the first robot walker, which is basically a gait, G-A-I-T, trainer uh, to help kids with cerebral palsy learn to walk in a fraction of the time it takes with traditional physical therapies. There are devices that do it currently, but they're in the range and the realm of about half a million dollars apiece which means it's prohibitive for most rehabilitation hospitals to own more than one. Uh, so we want to create something disruptive that costs a tenth of that uh, so that 10 times as many kids can be on these machines and learn how to walk more, 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 uh, more quickly, more rapidly. The exoskeleton part of the device, the part that actually joins to the leg, is also 3D printed um, and is being 3D printed uh, by a lab for us on the East Coast as we speak. Um, but again, this is just one of our projects. We have a puff sip mouth uh, for a quadriplegic uh, who wants to go back to school and can't afford the, the tools that are on the market at the moment. So we're hoping to get a, a mouse for him that is operated with his tongue and with puffing and sipping uh, actions. And again, components of that are 3D printed. Um, we're working on other voice recognition softwares for people with ALS. Um, tools to recognize retinoblastoma in children, um, so to try and prevent cancers, uh, eye cancers in kids under five or the, uh, the damage caused by them. Um, and we have a content platform that we just launched a month ago at notimpossiblenow.com. And what we do there is we don't just tell the stories of our own projects and how we're helping people, um, with this, with technology and with repurposing technologies uh, to help people. But we also uh, put out a call to action on that site where people can join our community. And so if you have a cause, if you know someone who needs help and you just can't quite uh, crack the code of how to help that person, then we put it out to our uh, community of innovators of I like to call them dynamos and doers, like people who have the education, whether they're MIT neuroscientists or uh, mechanical engineers or electrical engineers, but also people who are just cheerleaders and project managers and people who like to see things happen. So they come to the site um, and can either submit a cause or join a team um, and get active and actually use their skills um, you know, on the side in a Google Hangout session for an hour a week or so to advance a project that uses technology for the sake of humanity. Um, our, the other guiding principle we have is help one, help many. Again, we, we tell one story, we help one person, um, and we hope that that tool that we create to help that one person also has application to helping many others. Um, the other way this slogan, I guess, can be translated is that by helping one person we show that and not helping thousands when we, when people help thousands um, consumers and people who consume that content seem to think that that's a job left for institutions and, and wealthy individuals like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett um, but when you can help one person and just show how these tools and how simple these tools can be then we just hope to inspire others to think about how they can help one person too um, so help one, help many has become a really important uh, principle that we, we try and abide by as well. Um, but uh, for Not Impossible, uh, you can tweet us at Not, not Imposs. You can follow us at Not Impossible. Um, show us photos of what you're working on at Not Impossible Now. 
um, and certainly go and, and, and visit us at notimpossiblenow.com to tell us your stories uh, because we believe that this is truly a community effort um, and we like to hear about what everyone's doing and promote everyone um, and what they're up to so that everybody's causes can get furthered. Like like we say, there's there's no degree of separation anymore from someone with a good idea and someone willing to implement it. Um, and it doesn't matter where around the globe you are that that can be affected, especially with people with the skills that you guys have. Um, so it's been a pleasure to present this to you this morning. Um, and I really enjoy uh, and look forward to, uh, to a Q&A at the end of the session after Coffee Speaks as well. So thank you again. Thank you, Elliot, for a great presentation. And now I'll hand it over to Kofi for his talk. Hello, I. Hello. Yes, Kofi, it's all yours. Yes, thank, thank you very much for the, the invitation and this opportunity you, you give us to, to present our modest uh, initiative in Togo. Before I um, talk about 3D printing, I would like to present uh, our space, WellAB, and this philosophy, low I take, that uh, which guide everything we do uh, in, in WellAB. Uh, WellAB is uh, uh, well, WellAB is um, is a space uh, very inspiring by uh, the Fab Lab and the Maker Movement, and it's also a space where we try to um, to show the proximity uh, between uh, the Maker Movement and our African uh, traditions. And so. It's a, a space we we, we we try to emphasize in collaboration and uh, 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 try to put uh, in front this this uh, ethic of of sharing between our our young um, community. It's also a space you can find uh, tools. And uh, of course, uh, CNC uh, machine like in every uh, every fab lab. So Wellab is also uh, uh, a community. We have about uh, 20 members in our group. Uh, the middle age is uh, 19 years years old. We have about uh, 30 percent of girls. And in this space, we make a lot of workshop uh, uh, on on this spirit of uh, uh, democracy technology to to share our our our, um, our knowledge and help uh, young people to develop a technological project. So the the philosophy of Wellab is what we call low high tech. Try to do a very uh, high technological project, but in uh, in the respect of our 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 um, our possibilities and our 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 culture, uh, we we use a lot of uh, uh, e-waste in Wellab uh, uh, because we we want also to do uh, um, things uh, in 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 low cost uh, low cost way and. The, the the in Wellab you can you can come and try to and, and share your your your, your knowledge with, with everyone. You can develop technological projects uh, with everyone. And one of the projects we we develop is this Jerry project, who uh, who aims to try to to make com computer uh, ourselves in uh, in plastic can. So we are we are well known uh, uh, all over the world for our 3D uh, printer project, the the Wafat uh, 3D printer, and this 3D printer is the first uh, uh, the first one uh, born in Africa, and we have the the specificity to be also uh, a 3D printer made entirely with e-waste, and it is a. a, a a machine uh, that uh, 
uh, Adrian Bowyer uh, see uh, as the future of the of the two D printing. But everybody don't don't have the the faith of uh, Adrian Bowyer and. A lot of people ask us how we do with this machine and how we try to um, to solve uh, a, a very urgent uh, problem with this with this machine. So since uh, some uh, some months, we we launch a lot of programs, uh, social programs and research programs to try to find. Uh, very very useful application uh, for this machine we create in in Wellab. I would just like to present you three of these programs we develop in Wellab. The first one is um, the program we call uh, Africa Cyber 3D Printing uh, uh, Cafe, uh, and the objective is of this program is to really democratize the, the access to this technology and encourage uh, an habitual use in put uh, 3D print printer in our, our, uh, the, the Cyber Cafe. We have another uh, program uh, on, on uh, based on research that, that we call 3D Print Co uh, Conf Conference. And uh, for, we try to bring together specialists in a specific domain, and we uh, present uh, them our technology, and we ask them to help us to find application in uh, in their their domain, and we begin in this with uh, medicine. And in last December, we organized a big conference with the the most known uh, doctor of of the country. And after this, uh, we have a contract with our national center of prosthesis, who give us who, who which give us some. Some pieces we try to, to uh, we, are, we are trying to, to replicate. The last program I would like to present you is the 3D print educative program, uh, and the objective of this program is to um, to put uh, the 3D printer in the hands of the very young people because we saw that uh, we are maybe very old <laughs> ourselves to to find uh, very. Uh, Creative uh, um, utility for this technology, but the, the young uh, boys and girls we have in our community, who, who have about 14, uh, 15 years old, are very creative with the uh, with 3D printer. So we launched this program and we we test it in a school in our neighborhood, and we have about uh, 10 young boys and girls who who are learning about. Uh, Drawing in 3D and and print in 3D. So uh, is very quickly um, the w w all uh, these many programs we try to 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 launch to to, to help us find uh, application creative application and useful application for this machine we develop in our our space. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for an insightful talk, Kofi. And now we'll open up uh, uh, for Q&A, and questions have been coming in. Please use the Q&A window located below the chat window to type in your questions for the presenter. Um, so we, we'll start with our Q&As now. And uh, Elliot, <laughs> maybe this is a question uh, you can answer. Um, one of our audience has asked, uh, the RoboHand is a very inspirational project, and you've definitely made progress with it. But was finding funding for the project challenging for you in the initial stages? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we have a, uh, a – some call it idiotic, or we call it, <laughs> call, it, call it reckless, but we have an approach that we commit to something, and then we figure out a way to do it. Uh, so Nick has three young boys and I have one young boy and so we felt like this was a project that needed to happen. Uh, so we set a date for it um, before we knew whether it was going to be possible or not. And when you have a company that is called Not Impossible, you're pretty much you're pretty much tasked with doing these sorts of things. And so really Mick and I would both have other jobs so we were we were kind of putting our, our 
time in full time uh, pro bono on these projects at first. Um, it's now developed to a point where we can't do that anymore because it's grown to a bigger operation. Uh, but we basically were putting things on credit cards while we talked to brands about coming on board and whether they believed in the mission. Um, and we were thankful that both Intel, um, Intel came on board, but very close to the time we were taking off. So most of the things were paid for in advance in terms of flights and things like that. Um, and the printers and the filament and the also plastic materials. Um, and then a company called Presipart, uh, a precision engineering company that is, I think, Swiss uh, has a genesis in Switzerland, but we were working with their team in, in upstate New York, and they came on board to support the project as well. So we were thankful, obviously, that we were able to cover the cost of the project that way. Um, but we have other active projects now that don't have funding yet, uh, but we're just making them happen using uh, primarily volunteers, um, until a point where we're able to bring a brand on board and ensure that the the project can uh, get made and get finished in the best way possible. Thank you. Another question is uh, again for you, Elliot. Is that how do you see collaboration? You know, from engineers, from obviously the doc doctors involved. How do you how did you do that successfully? And if, there, if you want to share, share yeah. that experience. Yeah. Actually, uh, most of our projects, the the initial conversations take place in Google Hangouts. If they're one-on-ones, they take place in Skype often, uh, but Google Hangouts predominantly. And the cool thing was that, you know, we had people coming in who were physical therapists who offered a pragmatic look at, hey, this is going to be a tool that is going to be worn for long periods of time. Let's make sure that it's breathable. Um, others coming in and saying, well, the mechanics and the leverage you're getting from this fulcrum point can be enhanced by adding a second uh, small cuff to tie the cabling to uh, on the top of the tricep. Um, so there were people who kind of uh, came up with different ideas. And then, of course, Richard, who invented the robo hand, uh, was letting us know what difficulties he'd faced uh, in the last couple of years as he toured the world, helping people and giving them uh, new new hands to use. Uh, so the the body of the hand itself that we went to uh, the Sudan is uh, kind of more enclosed, uh, so it's a little bit more protected. Um, and basically everybody's suggestions were kind of taken on board and then the engineers were used to either the digital en engineers were used to uh, design uh, the, the prosthetic and then uh, yeah it was really it really was a truly collaborative process what was the coolest thing I think was also getting on the phone to Dr. Tom and this speaks to what coffee is doing as well is that uh, we got to, on the phone with Dr. Tom in the Nuba Mountains and just asked him what he had in his possession, like what he had that he threw away every day, what kind of materials. Was there IV tubing? Um, and if so, did it have an elastic component to it? Uh, were there were there needles? What gauge were the needles? Were they able to be sterilized and potentially used as cross you know cross screws and cross uh, cross uh, pieces to bear some of the weight uh, inside the hand? Um, what, what, how, how much cardboard was he throwing away every day? Were we able to use it for paper mache or do some other things with it? Uh, you know, and it didn't matter whether we used it, ended up using the ideas or not, but taking that look at what was available from a waste element, uh, you know, led to the thinking about how sustainable the practice would be and how sustainable this lab setup would be. And I think we all hope that at some point, uh, the plastics, uh, that PET and things like that could be easily uh, translated into 3D filament so that we could both take waste uh, and use it for something purposeful like building prosthetic limbs and things like that uh, using 3D printers. But, uh, yeah, the, the collaboration was actually the most fun. And on all our projects, we start with Google Hangouts and then eventually to help the person we're helping, we need to get them all in, this, in the one place. Thanks. Kofi, this question um, for you as well, that in terms of funding and, um, you know, uh, for setting up such a massive project in Africa, uh, did you face that challenge? And also, did you have any political interference from powerful people? Um, what were some of the challenges you faced uh, while setting up OLAB and working on the 3D printer? 
Um, we are a very, a very young uh, community, and what we we try to do is to be uh, uh, to be independent and do what we can do with the, the resources we have in our hands. So we develop uh, programs, and we we try to launch uh, very in, 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 uh, innovative uh, programs. But we can we can't. Um, I don't know how to say to say this. We can put them very, very uh, in in a very, in a very long way. We we need help if we want to uh, to change the scale and um, to, uh, to 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 really uh, 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 have a big in impact. But what we do now is to do what we can with our our resources in Wellab. And maybe if uh, the the results are very uh, efficient, um, that can give birth to a more ambitious uh, program, maybe for 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 all the country or for for the Africa. Thanks. Um, here's a question. Maybe both of you can answer. Um, since 3D printers take a long, you know, 3D printing take a long time. How have you tackled the problem of stable power supplies in the context where you work? Um, any of you? I mean, both of you could answer. Elliot, maybe you want to answer first. Yes, um, that was uh, definitely a concern. Uh, with the prints taking a while, and that's why the new printers also are so important. Some of the new printer models have a tool that they will, uh, if something happens, they will stop the print, uh, and then they will restart the print uh, when they get their power source going back on or when the filament is fixed or when some other issue like overheating of the extruders is, is fixed. Uh, but most of the printers still uh, continue to ghost print or fail to print, um, and so you're left with a mess of filament and uh, having to use that time again to build something new. Um, so it is definitely a problem. In the Sudan, the, the, the conditions in the shed during the day were so hot that the filament was sticking to itself. So uh, basically that was uh, hacked a solution by, by putting the filament up on a, on a very high spool so that it was kind of constantly hanging rather than just sitting at the back of the printer where it was supposed to go. Um, and then again, like because the filament was sticking, um, the decision was made to print at night when most other people were not using the electricity. Um, and again, it was a solar powered hospital with a backup generator. And uh, so the decision was made to do it at night. And then the problem there was that the lights of the 3D printers attracted bugs. So there were literally, quite literally, bugs in the system in the morning. So we had to set up some screens to protect the printers from that as well. Kofi, what, how did you uh, handle that? Yes, did you have? We don't have electricity. We don't have electricity uh, every every day in, in in even in Wellab. But uh, what I can say is that it's, uh, it is Africa. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. That was, a, that was definitely a phrase that was repeated to us often. It was T I A. This is Africa. So yeah. yes, indeed, I can. Uh, can empathize. So how how did you manage uh, you know work around it then coffee did you have a like Elliot talked about a backup generator there but obviously that's probably not a practical solution so well how do you no, deal with you know power outage No unfortunately we don't have solution for this problem we don't have generator we don't have enough resources to to have a, an, an alternative of for for the for the electricity, maybe we should uh, try to find solution with solar panels. But uh, from now we don't have solution for this problem, unfortunately. Okay, thanks, uh, Kofi. Uh, another question that came in for you is that it's great that you're putting this tech in front of children. So, what are some of the interesting things that kids are using 3D printing for in Molan? Uh, we, we are just at the beginning of this program, and um, what we see, what we uh, we see is that uh, our, our young members are uh, more interested on this technology than the, even even Afat who have the idea to 
to create this machine is not uh, as as very uh, interesting uh, like Daniel, by example, who have uh, uh, 14 years years old. So we 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 think that uh, they will uh, this this young uh, boys and girls will create things uh, uh, more efficient. Uh, like us, when the the they will the, they will have the the the, the, the matrix of of, of the uh, of, of this machine. For now, they they just print uh, gadget, uh, uh, badge, etc. But in some years, if we begin uh, very now with young young uh, people, we can hope that uh, in some in some years they they, they create. Uh, things very useful and, in, and and adapted to our, our African context. Great. A related question that came in is that, uh, you know, somebody interest who's wanting to go to schools and offer a sort of seminar for kids to you how to use three D printers. How do you choose what age is appropriate one, and how do you keep them interesting in in the project? Uh, for for, for uh, Either of you can answer the question. Uh, we we actually have uh, this team of, like I mentioned in the in the presentation, we have the team working on the robot walker who are sixteen. Uh, we didn't choose, we didn't necessarily choose to have a team of sixteen year olds. They expressed an interest in working on this uh, project because they have interest in robotics and they're part of a robotics club. Uh, and thankfully there is a school that has that in California, which is, like is rare, uh, even in, you know, even in a major city. Uh, so they they are like very well versed in having access to these tools and it's pretty amazing to see. And just, uh, my, my son is too young to, to operate a 3D printer, but Mick's uh, sons are 10, 8 and 4. And what's great to see there is that they always want to print something when they come in from school uh, or when they visit the office. And they're generally printing um, toys, uh, but also nuts and bolts and other things. And what's great is the mentality that they want to print a toy rather than go buy a toy. Um, so I know in developing countries it's not they don't it's not the same luxury, but um, but here in the U.S. it's it's good to see that it creates a mentality of creation and creativity uh, rather than just a consumer mentality. And I think that that's going to that's gonna serve some, some kids well. And we also presented at the International Science Fair uh, that Intel runs. Um, and just what we saw people using 3D printing for there uh, was pretty incredible. You know, everything from exoskeletons to, um, to kind of Oculus Rift type um, glasses, glass casings, housings for virtual reality and augmented reality. And these are all teenagers, so um, I don't know how young is too young, but I think that whenever someone shows an inclination or an openness to looking at different things, uh, I think the younger the better because then they don't see the barriers that we see uh, at a generation above. Thanks. Uh, here's a question for both of you. It's very interesting. If the large international aid organizations uh, have seen your work, what has been their reaction? Kofi, you want to go you, first? All right. Kofi, would you like to answer? Yes. Can, yes. can you repeat the, the question, please? If, are, have, have any large international aid organizations seen your work? If so, what has been their reaction? Um, no, no, we don't have um, any, any international organization who, who, uh, who, who work with, with us. We are... WellAB is, is really a, a marginal space. Uh, for for now, we don't have uh, we don't have uh, work with, with any any organization. We are we are we are we have just two years old, and we are we are just at the beginning. Maybe we don't uh, not yet very known for 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 have this type of collaboration. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're a young company too. Project Daniel, though, because of the amount of press it received, did uh, you know it was on CNN and things like that, and those sorts of um, media exposure that it received really did uh, create awareness amongst some um, institutional operations, including some 
facets of the United Nations, and they they were curious to to see how many how much it would cost to have uh, essentially a, a Daniel kit, like uh, how much would it cost to have a couple of printers and some filaments and some auto plastic, and to integrate it as like when they go into a place and to adding to add this tool to add this toolkit how much that would cost as a unit. And the discussions really didn't go beyond that uh, yet with that institution, with that particular institution. But that was something that uh, that they were mindful of and definitely reached out to ask us about. And then there have been other non-profits and other entities that set up kind of medical tents and other kind of medical, uh, you know, they'll come in for three days and do a treatment facility for three days. And they were also like, curious to see whether this was something that could be implemented in their operations. And like we say, we're, we're happy for anyone to take this technology and use these open source files. And we totally believe in the open source movement in that regard, that all these things can be made better and better for that local condition. And so, uh, so we're, we're, we're more than happy to provide that information to people. Great. Thanks. Um, another question, uh, again, open to both of you, is that an, an audience wants to know, one of the audience says, uh, can we, are there any other prospects of 3D printing apart from medical users and education in, in developing countries? Can we think of 3D printing everywhere, or is it subject to some requirements needed uh, before use and implementation? Look, for me, I think it can be used everywhere. We've seen people in Haiti use it to, uh, who have, again, like people in the Sudan that we, we're introduced it to, of course, like most people here in the U.S. have never seen a 3D printer in operation. Uh, so to bring it to a place where uh, the education system is not as complete, is not as regimented, these uh, the people, the trainees um, who are working in Sudan on this project have the equivalent of what we would think of in developed nations as like a fourth to sixth grade education, and they have absolutely no trouble picking up this technology. So again, I don't see any access. I think that's the beauty of it is that the access is not limited. Um, as long as they can get their hands on this equipment. And Kofi is showing that you can get your hands on this equipment no matter where you are, no matter what tools you have. Um, as long as you have the mindset, you can you can make it happen. Uh, but, yeah, in Haiti, they were using it to create 3D-printed umbilical cord clamps. Um, in, in another part of the country, we saw people using it to create airway stints. Uh, for people whose tracheas were collapsing or who needed some access to air. Um, we've seen it being used for, well, as, as I say, we've, we've got some people using it for kind of exoskeleton devices um, at, at minimal cost and this ability to kind of prototype things with minimal, that are pretty complex at a minimal cost is, is, uh, is pretty incredible. And so I think that's going to make sure that it has a wide use um, in all places. If it can happen in a solar powered hospital in Sudan, then in, in, a, in a essentially a war zone, um, then it should be able to happen everywhere. Great. I think we have question, time for one last question. Um, again, open to both of you. How can 3D printing technologies be harnessed to leapfrog the infrastructure problems in many developing countries? Would you like to comment on that, Elliot or Kofi? Um, I think uh, in country uh, like ours, uh, where the, the informal sector is very is very big, this technology can help a lot uh, because we we we, uh, um, we we are very dependent about uh, um, everything we use in Africa. In Africa, we are very dependent uh, for for the West, and with the, with this technology, we can uh, begin to. Uh, Try to uh, uh, produce some elements. We don't need to pay for uh, with, with high, high, high cost. And it is also a technology which is in our our culture. Of, uh, we uh, we have the culture, the, the, the culture of of this um, um, this uh, ability to to try to do things ourselves naturally in Africa, and if uh, some, some governments use uh, uh, this te 
technology like uh, uh, a, a developing way for, 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 for our nation, I think we can have uh, very good uh, results, even in infrastructure ways. Right. Thank you, Kofi and Elliot, for taking out time today. Um, that's all we have time for today. So on behalf of E4C, I would like to thank you all once again for joining us today. This is Chitra Sethi, Managing Editor of ASME.org. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.